uh, getting a little bit uh, crazy of, of uh, concurrency control in transactions by now. Uh, so today we're going to focus on um, a slightly different topic, it's still in the same area, but uh, something called recovery. So uh, the, the big question that we're now trying to address, we've, we've addressed how to, uh, how to support multiple transactions operating at the same time. Uh, the transactions actually give us a, uh, another uh, degree of safety, uh, something called uh, recoverability. And then the idea here is that we want to ensure that uh, any, any sort of operations that we do end up getting safely stored on disk. So um, I'm sure most of you have by now uh, heard of this uh, property called ACID, or, uh, also known as atomicity, uh, consist uh, consistency, isolation, and durability. And this is sort of the, uh, the gold standard by which uh, until about five, ten years ago, uh, databases were, were judged. Um, so a database, uh, the, the four things that, the, the four main things that a database was supposed to ensure, or a transaction processing system was supposed to ensure, uh, was that all transactions happen in isolation, so no two transactions uh, are ever able to interact with one another until one of them commits. Uh, consistency, so if the database starts out consistent and the transaction doesn't do anything to break consistency, then uh, it, no interleaving of those transactions should produce an inconsistent, inconsistent state either. Uh, that's, I guess, the, the main thing we've been focusing on for the last week or so. Uh, isolation, namely if uh, two transactions, oh sorry, atomicity is, atomicity is uh, transactions uh, either complete fully or never or don't occur at all. So either the transaction commits and becomes entirely visible, uh, persisted everything, um, or it doesn't happen at all, and no transaction, no other transaction will ever see any effects from that particular transaction. And then isolation is that any two transactions that occur at the same time uh, shouldn't interact with one another. And finally, durability. So as soon as a transaction commits, as soon as the transaction finishes and we receive notification that the transaction has finished, um, the effects of that transaction uh, should be persistent. And atomicity, uh, what we're going to talk about mostly to, uh, over the course of the next week or so, are the first and the last uh, properties here, namely atomicity. So even if a crash occurs, uh, the transaction should either be uh, completely, uh, the transaction's effects should either be completely visible uh, or completely invisible. And durability, so once a transaction commits, its uh, effects should be completely persistent. So let me lead into this with a little bit of uh, motivation. Let's say we have five transactions being processed at the same time, uh, T1 through T5, and time is going to go uh, to the right. So we're going to start off with transactions T1 and T4. Uh, they, they both start initially and keep going. Uh, eventually, transaction T2 also starts, joins this, this whole interleaved process. And eventually, T3 also starts. Now, by this point, T1 uh, finishes, it commits, it's happy. We keep going through time. Transaction 2 now uh, commits, it's done, it's happy. Uh, and transaction 5 starts. Transaction uh, three then commits, and moving on, uh, well, what happens now? A crash. Uh, the system breaks and uh, something goes wrong, somebody trips over a power cord, uh, or as illustrated here, somebody tries to use a tree uh, as an access path in completely the wrong way, um, and something bad happens, the system fails, and uh, transaction four and five, uh, they haven't committed yet, so uh, they're in this sort of limbo state. And what we'd like to ensure as a database is that in spite of that crash, in spite of the fact that there might be, uh, the, the uh, crash might have occurred uh, while these, uh, regardless of, of what the state of the disk is, regardless of whether or not we're buffering anything, uh, we'd like to ensure that because transactions one, two, and three uh, create, uh, they, they signaled that they had successfully committed. Uh, we want to make sure that when the database restarts, the effects of those three transactions are visible. 
And we want to also make sure that because transaction T4 and T5 haven't committed yet, the effects of those transactions are not visible. Uh, is that clear? All right. So, uh, to be precise, we want to be able to support recovery uh, from crashes. If the database, uh, somebody trips over a power cord, somebody tries to access a tree in the wrong way, uh, something goes wrong, we want to be able to restart the database uh, in some consistent state. And this means that any transactions that have committed fully have, uh, get recovered fully. And any transaction that has not yet committed or that has been aborted um, ends up getting fully discarded. And we basically want to, uh, the, the goal here is essentially to uh, provide the first and the last of those asset guarantees, atomicity and durability. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, over the course of t this lecture, I'm going to talk about a uh, general strategy, or uh, over the course of the week, I'm going to talk about a general strategy uh, for ensuring atomicity and durability, a uh, logging scheme called ARIES. Uh, that, and I'm going to sort of outline how, how ARIES works. Uh, now, the assumptions of ARIES are, uh, first off, that there is some form of concurrency control going on. And specifically, this is, it's tailored towards strict two-phase locking, um, although it may be, it's, it's possible to adapt it to other forms. And the second is that updates are happening in place. Uh, so we talked very briefly last week about this multi-version uh, representation of, of a database. Uh, the assumption here is that there is a single canonical copy of the entire database. That's what's getting stored on disk, and any time there's an update, that gets applied to that. Uh, that gets applied directly to that single canonical copy. Uh, sorry, uh, single canonical copy uh, on disk, but potentially also buffered in RAM. So we don't want to necessarily force everything to go to disk. Now, um, most of what uh, happens here is going to center around uh, the buffer pool. So the buffer pool uh, gives us this sort of nice intermediary between the the disk and uh, the memory, and all the transactions are going to be operating on the state in memory, uh, whereas uh, the disk is sort of our persistent copy. Uh, if we need to recover anything, if we need to restart the database, we're going to be re re uh, restarting it from the version that's on disk. And there are basically two, uh, two sort of challenges that we need to address, uh, two sort of uh, points in the design spectrum uh, where in order to achieve efficiency, we need to be able to uh, do things in a slightly less than safe way. And the first of these, uh, so the first challenge is that we want to, uh, whenever we, we modify a page, uh, we could ensure durability by uh, forcing every single write to go directly to disk. So if I, if I do a write, that write gets applied directly to the, the version of the, the state on disk. And if that happens, we've got durability. That's, I mean, that's great. Um, on the other hand, uh, as several of, you, several of you have noticed already, uh, even for this, this uh, project too, um, the flush operation is extremely, extremely expensive. Uh, you don't want to have to do this every single time you do, a, even every single time a transaction does a write. So basically, the first question is, is how do we avoid forcing everything to disk, or how do we minimize the cost of forcing everything to go to disk? The second question is, do we want to allow buffer frames to be stolen? So again, as some of you may have noticed by now, the buffer manager has this feature where uh, if it's out of memory, it can pick another, uh, it, it can pick some buffer frame to evict, and that whatever was in that frame has to get flushed to disk, and then get um, then that, that memory gets freed up. Now, uh, if we allow stealing, that's good because that allows multiple transactions to access pages. Uh, if there's one, uh, if a transaction touches uh, one row of one table uh, exactly once, and then goes on to to sit there for a couple of hours doing some processing on something else, then uh, we don't necessarily want to have that one that entire page. Uh, taken up by that transaction. Uh, we want to potentially free that page up uh, for other use. On the other hand, uh, if we do allow stealing, 
that essentially forces this page to go to disk. And once that page goes to disk, uh, then when we recover, once that page goes to disk, then we're essentially committed to uh, committing that particular transaction. If the transaction aborts, or if a crash occurs before that transaction successfully commits, then we need to be able to uh, get rid of, of that change that has occurred. So that's basically the second challenge. Do we allow buffer pool frames to be stolen? So I'll put these two up on a grid. Uh, if we force everything to disk and we don't allow buffer frames to be stolen, well, that's an absolutely trivial solution. We can, uh, that'll give us both atomicity and durability uh, without any sort, of, uh, any sort of programming overheads whatsoever. On the other hand, where we'd like to be is we'd like to support both of these features. We'd like to have uh, both the ability to steal buffer page, uh, for one transaction to steal buffer pages from another, or buffer frames from another transaction, and we'd like to uh, avoid uh, flushing data to disk wherever possible. Okay, so uh, what are the challenges here? Well, stealing uh, is, is sort of a, uh, a metaphor for atomicity here. Um, in order to steal a particular frame, that page has to be written to disk. And if that page is written to disk, then uh, the effects of a particular transaction uh, become globally visible. Or at the very least, uh, when we restart the database, those effects will be visible because they've been written to disk. When we recover, we don't know that that transaction has been aborted or not. Uh, is this, uh, is, are people clear on uh, everything up to this point, by the way? So essentially, we need to be able to uh, even in order to in order to support stealing, we need to be able to support uh, a mechanism by which we can undo the effects of T's rights. So if T doesn't commit, we need to we still need to be able to uh, undo those effects. Now, this uh, this question of forcing data to disk is sort of a metaphor for enforcing durability. So if, a system cra if the system crashes before some modification gets flushed to disk, um, then that modification is gone. Um, so we need to be able to ensure that every single transaction that has committed, all of its pages have to be flushed to disk. Uh, but now this opens up another question. So what if we have uh, five pages? What if a transaction modifies five pages? and the system crashes after the third uh, page gets flushed to disk. So what happens then? Has the transaction committed? No, because all of them haven't been flushed to disk. On the other hand, three of them have been flushed to disk. So essentially we need to uh, have a mechanism that allows us to, uh, before we actually start writing those modifications to disk, we need to have a way of sort of telling the database, okay, these are the changes we're going to make. And uh, then once we start making those actual changes to disk, we need to have a mechanism uh, when, when the database recovers, because we've, we've flushed these, these intentions, because we've flushed uh, to disk this, uh, the, the set of changes that we're going to make, the si uh, and the system crashes, the system can still replay those operations. I'll get into what I mean by that in, in uh, a couple of slides. Uh, but that basically the, the, the question is, uh, the, the challenge here is being able to uh, replay all of the operations that you've, you've essentially committed uh, to committing. So ba basically once you start writing these things to disk, you need to basically ensure that uh, it is still possible to commit those changes. Now, the basic approach that we're going to take in order to uh, in order to uh, achieve this is to first log every, is to log every single change that we're going to make. So every single time we make any uh, transaction makes any change whatsoever to the database, we record that into a log, and this log contains all of the information that we need in order, in order to do both redos and undos. Now this may seem like it's, it's, it's going to be something that's extremely expensive, uh, but there's a couple of things that actually save us. So uh, first off, um, 
every single access to this log, in general, is just going to be a sequential write. So uh, we're always going to be appending to the log, uh, so disk access overheads are not going to be huge. Um, typically, we don't need to write entire pages to the, to the log. Uh, usually, we're going to be changing only a couple of tuples at a time. And if that's the case, uh, we can usually fit lots and lots of updates uh, into a single page of, uh, of the log. And if all else fails, we can still use uh, a separate disk for the log, uh, which means we essentially have no, no serious overheads on uh, data access that we normally perform. Uh, is this clear? Any questions? Great. So what does one of these log records look like? What does an entry in, in one of these logs look like? Well, we need to keep track of the transaction that caused that log, uh, that log entry. So uh, if we commit or abort that particular transaction, uh, we know which log entries are applicable to it. We need to know what page got modified, uh, and we need to know what data in the page got modified. Uh, so essentially, this, this tells us uh, where the modification occurred. And then we also need, in order to do um, redos, we need to know what data got written to that part of the page. And in order to support undos, we, knew, we need to know what data got deleted from that page. Is that clear? OK. So um, the, the central theme of Aries, the central uh, component of Aries, is this idea called write ahead logging. And we're going to basically uh, describe what I'm going to do right now is describe uh, a simple protocol for doing right ahead logging. So the first, uh, basically, we need to do uh, we need to enforce two kind uh, two specific types of guarantees on this log. First off, before we write a particular uh, data page to disk, we need to make sure that the log record for that particular uh, for all of the updates that apply to that page. Um, have been also flushed to disk. And that's going to guarantee atomicity because it means that even if we don't successfully write that page, we can still redo the write while recovering the database. And the second restriction is that we need to ensure that um, before a transaction commits, all of the log records uh, for that particular transaction have also been committed. And that guarantees durability. So any thoughts on how you'd actually do recovery in this setting? So if we have a log uh, with every single update uh, that has occurred, um, think back to the, the example I gave at, at first. Uh, transaction 4 and transaction 5 have done a whole bunch of operations, some of which have been flushed to disk. Um, how, would you do, how would you go about doing recovery in that setting? So the system crashes. Transaction 4 has written, let's say, three pages, and transaction 5 has written two pages. <coughs> uh, uh, sorry, go first. Uh, undo all the pages that are written in the log. Okay, so go through the log and find all of the operations for transactions 4 and 5, and undo all of those operations. I'll undo all of those writes. Okay. Uh, what if, let's say, transaction three hasn't uh, fully been written to disk yet? Let's say two two of the three pages that it modifies have been written to disk. You do the, the okay. So you uh, you look at all of the operations that three has performed and you make sure that those changes are, are written to disk. Great. Okay, so let's uh, zoom into this log structure a little bit more. Um, every single log record is going, to by, is going to be identified also by a sequence number. And for every data page that we have in our database, we're going to associate that with uh, the log sequence number of the last page uh, to modify that, uh, sorry, the last uh, operation in the log to modify that particular page. Now, in memory, we're going to keep around um, a pointer to basically the last 
log sequence number that has been flushed to disk. So there's going to be a, a bunch of log records already on disk, and there's going to be a bunch of log records that are still only in memory. And we may want to do that for buffering purposes. And so the first of these guarantees that we're going to, that we want to provide, we can ensure that by making sure that before we write a page with some log sequence number uh, to disk, um, the, the flushed log, the, the last flushed log sequence number has to be higher uh, than, than the, last, uh, the log sequence number of the last uh, operation to modify that particular page. Before being actually flushed, Yes, yeah, so before we flush the page, we need to flush all of the log entries up to that point in the log. And by that point in the log, I mean uh, the, the last log entry that modified that particular page. Okay. Now, uh, a log record, uh, they're going to be uh, six, uh, five different flavors of log entries. So what I've been describing up to this point uh, has been these update logs. So every time a change happens to a page, uh, we're going to record all of the information about that change uh, in the log record. But we also need the log to reflect all of the uh, transaction operations that have occurred. Oh, sorry, six, yeah, six, six types. Um, we need to record when a particular excuse me, when a particular transaction commits and when a partic particular transaction aborts. Um, also, for various reasons, we'll keep track of when uh, a particular transaction uh, commit the, the commit process has completed. Uh, so, recall uh, a commit basically involves writing a bunch of pages to disk, and an abort in, uh, involves undoing a bunch of operations. So we need to keep track of when that process is finished, when we've written all of the pages to disk, and when we've, uh, when we've finished undoing all of the operations for an aborted transaction. Uh, there's also uh, one other type of log record called a seal, uh, compensation log record. Um, I'll get to that in a couple of slides. But just bear, bear that in mind that that exists. Um, Ah, great. Uh, now, before I get to the actual protocol, uh, one last bit, uh, one last set of definitions. Uh, we're going to keep track of um, two thing, uh, two additional pieces of information, uh, and this can be kept entirely in memory. So we're going to keep track of all of the currently running transactions, uh, along with a transaction ID, uh, a status for that transaction, aborted, committed. Uh, running, um, as well as the last log sequence number uh, that that transaction has uh, inserted into the log. That doesn't necessarily mean the last log sequence number that got flushed to disk, just uh, the last, the, the log sequence number of the last operation uh, performed by the transaction. Uh, we're also going to keep track of uh, all of the dirty pages at the moment. Uh, so we're going to keep a dirty page table uh, that stores one entry for each uh, dirty page in the buffer pool, and that's going to contain uh, the log sequence number of the first log record uh, that caused that particular page to be dirty. And that's going to allow us to do uh, replays. Sorry. No, that's going to allow us to do uh, flushes correctly. Okay, um, so a transaction, when it executes, it's uh, basically just to recap. Uh, a transaction is basically going to be a series of reads and writes followed by an, a commit or an abort. We have two-phase locking, and we're going to try and uh, produce an algorithm uh, that supports uh, steal uh, without forcing uh, buffer frame stealing without forcing data to disk. And we're going to do that using this write-ahead logging technique. And just to give you sort of the big picture all in one slide, a log consists of a sequence of log records, contains all of these, uh, all of these fields. Uh, the database contains all of the data pages. Each data pa uh, the database on disk contains all of the database, uh, data pages. Uh, each page has a log sequence number of the last log entry to modify it, uh, and then a master record that contains 
sort of all of the metadata uh, for all of those tables. And then in memory, we're also going to keep around a transaction table, uh, a dirty page table, and this pointer to the, the last log sequence number that got flushed. Okay, so let's uh, go through a small sequence of, of operations here. Um, where a transaction aborts. Uh, and although there's no crashes here, I'm going to sort of hint at a couple of places where uh, crash, uh, we need to do something special to support crash recovery. So we've got our disk, we've got our transaction table, and we've got our log. So the first, uh, so essentially what we're going to do in order to abort this transaction is sort of play the log back in reverse. And as we do that, we're going to undo records. But before we do that, we need to, uh, we need to mark that this particular transaction uh, has been aborted. And we need to indicate that in the log. So we're going to write, uh, and that's one of these things that's necessary for crash recovery. So we're going to write a new abort entry into the log, append it in there. And then we're going to look at the transaction table. We're going to find the transaction, uh, the row corresponding to the transaction that aborted. And we're going to find the last log sequence number uh, that that transaction modified. Now that's going to point to some entry in the log, which contains a bunch of stuff. Uh, but among the things that are in there uh, is going to be an image of the last, uh, is going to be uh, basically all of the data uh, that got overwritten by that particular operation. And so we're going to take that, we're going to take that operation, uh, the, sorry, all of the data that got overwritten, we're going to flush it to disk. Uh, sorry, we're going to overwrite that particular, uh, the contents of, of the page that got modified. Uh, we're going to take those, we're going to write that to disk, and then we're going to take the... So the, the log entries also have a pointer uh, to the previous log entry uh, for that particular transaction. So you can think of this as sort of a linked list. Um, the transaction table points to the last log entry for that particular transaction, and then that, uh, transact, uh, that log entry points to the next log record for that particular transaction. So basically every time you, you write a log entry, the last LSN becomes the previous LSN of the new log entry. And so we're basically just going to repeat this process, going back through the log uh, and overwriting the, the data in the database uh, with data that we recovered from this, uh, from the log. Okay, so now we also want to support um, some sense of crash recovery here. So, uh, before, uh, how do I put this? So, as we're going through the log, we need to make sure that, uh, we need to make sure that the, uh, the, the log actually encodes the fact that uh, we've performed this operation. So uh, the, actual, uh, the actual process of undoing a transaction, of, of rolling back a transaction, that's, that involves a series of operations as well. And in order to efficiently support recovery, we need to make sure that those operations are logged as well. So before we, uh, before we actually uh, write the, the rolled back version of the page, uh, we're also going to write these uh, compensation log records uh, to, the, to the log. So in, in essence, while we're doing the undo, uh, we're still logging all of the operations that we're performing as part of that undo. We will uh, get back to CLRs uh, a bit more in depth. Oh wow, plenty of time. Uh, we will get back to CLRs uh, a bit more on Wednesday. Uh, but basically, the, this this is sort of used for recovering. Uh, so basically, the, the the question that these these are trying to address is what happens if the system crashes while you are doing an undo. You might end up with uh, some uh, inconsistent state because you've tried to recover, uh, you've, you've tried to undo some uh, actions taken by a, a uh, taken by the, the transaction while it was being undone. So yes. Is it possible to have 100% recovery by using logs? 
Uh, what do you mean by 100% recovery? There are so many cases when the crash can occur. Is yes. Uh, yep. So essentially, Aries is, um, and we'll get into this a lot more later in the week, uh, but Aries is uh, what's the, the most paranoid algorithm you will ever encounter. Um, it, regardless of when a crash occurs, Aries will leave the database in a state that it can be recovered from. Any transaction that commits is guaranteed to have, uh, is guaranteed to be recovered at some point, even if. Uh, sorry. Does it affect the throughput? Um, so Aries act doesn't affect throughput that much. Um, recovery. Uh, the, the recovery process is not necessarily fast. Um, although we're, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of. of techniques to make it fast. But basically, the uh, even if you crash while recovering from a crash that happened during a crash that ba basically, at any point in this algorithm, uh, in the execution of this algorithm, or in the execution of modifications uh, to the database in, in the course of its normal operations, uh, Aries can still recover uh, the database to a consistent state that includes all of the data that has been uh, successfully committed. And I will hopefully, by the end of the week, uh, have proved that uh, to your satisfaction. Okay. Um, now there's this... Uh, right, so a, a compensation re uh, log record is, is sort of an indication that an attempt was made to uh, redo a particular, uh, sorry, to undo a particular uh, operation on the, the database. And as, as a consequence of that, we never need to undo it. Uh, can anyone think of a, a situation where we might need to sort of redo, uh, redo a, uh, a recovery step? Yeah, exactly. So if if a crash occurred, and this is one of those, those sort of paranoid uh, situations, uh, if we are, if we crash while at, while doing an un, a sequence of undo operations, um, we might actually need to redo some of those undo operations. And so the compensation log record is basically there to allow us to uh, to identify which ones we need to redo. Okay. Um, Right, so undo is, is not entirely trivial. Uh, commits are actually quite a bit easier. Uh, we start by, as, as with the abort, we start by appending a commit record to the log. Then we just need to ensure that all of the log records up to uh, the transaction's last log sequence number, uh, sorry, then we need to make sure that all of the transactions up to the lab, uh, transaction's last log sequence number, which is basically going to be uh, the, the commit record, uh, have been flushed to disk. And if that's the case, then that guarantees that uh, the flushed log sequence number is going to be greater than or equal to uh, the last uh, sequence number of uh, the trend, uh, of the uh, all of the pages modified by that transaction. And again, note that all of these writes are basically uh, just sequential, synchronous writes to the disk. They're things that can be done very, very quickly. Now, once we've committed, uh, sorry, once we've flushed all of these records to disk, including the commit record, then we can safely return uh, to, the, uh, to the user, wh whoever is uh, invoking the transaction, and tell them, yes, your transaction has now committed successfully. No matter what happens to the database at this point, uh, assuming the disk still survives, uh, your data is safe. Now, after that happens, we're going to uh, write a record to the log that says, um, we are done with this commit. Everything is successfully flushed to disk. The user has been notified. Uh, it's, everything is, is as it should be. OK, uh, so basically, that is all I have for this week. Um, in the last 10 minutes, are there any questions uh, about the project?
or about this comment? Yes? Uh, any goals in phase of email? Uh, uh, repeat the question, please. The strict phase locking. Two phase locking? Strict two phase locking? Okay. Um, sure. Um, actually, why don't I do that on the board? Um, So two-phase locking is uh, basically just a, um, a restriction on a normal locking system where you can acquire locks, release locks. Uh, it is a restriction on one of these systems that forces your, your transaction uh, to proceed in basically two phases. Uh, phase one where you can acquire locks and phase two where you can release locks. Uh, the this this is perhaps a little bit over general. Uh, typically, what will happen is that you have one phase at the very beginning where you acquire all of your locks as you're doing your transaction, and then at the very end, uh, you have sort of the small step where you just release all of the locks as as one big bulk operation. Now, the motivation for doing this is that it essentially enforces uh, conflict serializability. Um, if I acquire a lock on an object in the database, any object, a page, a, 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 a table, a row, um, if I acquire a lock on that object, then no other transaction can acquire a lock on that object until I'm completely done. Even if you do this as, as actual two phases where you sort of progressively release the locks as you move along, um, you can still uh, you can still sort of rewrite that transaction as as if it was was sort of holding on to the, there. Um, actually, the, I'll get back to that in a moment. But um, the idea is essentially that uh, by by acquiring the lock on all of these objects and holding on to it until you are essentially ready to commit or not, then you have essentially. You have essentially, um, in uh, what do you call it, forced a sort of ordering over all accesses to a particular object. So you, if you access a particular object, um, once you have a lock on that object, no other transaction can acquire a lock on that object until you commit. And how is this different from the normal Oh, sorry, you're asking about the distinction between strict two-phase locking and... Um, the, so there's a couple of... The, uh, so strict two -phase lo in strict two-phase locking, um, I will, uh, I need to double check this, uh, I'll get back to you on Wednesday, but the, uh, so there are two, two distinctions. The first is, there's a couple of variations of two-phase locking, uh, sorry, a couple of variations of uh, transaction processing that don't use uh, two-phase locking. Um, I talked about a couple of these on and off. Uh, so for example, uh, index accesses. Um, the, the various index access uh, algorithms that I talked about, a couple of them don't use two-phase locking. Uh, a couple of them use uh, something that provides the same guarantees as two-phase locking, uh, because you're, you're sort of always accessing the, the locks uh, from top to bottom. Uh, but it isn't strictly two-phase locking because you are you are still releasing locks before the release phase occurs. So, uh, re uh, so recall the, the index, uh, talking about index locking, uh, if I want to read this page, uh, I don't just go to the page directly uh, because other transactions could be modifying uh, the intermediate index uh, uh, index, index structures. So instead what I do is I acquire a shared lock on the root, I acquire a shared lock on this, I acquire a shared lock on this. Now this is uh, correct, 
but inefficient because it means even though I, I no longer care about this, this root level uh, of the index, the root level of the index, um, no other transaction can then acquire an exclusive lock on that uh, index. And if I need to modify this, I'd have to grab an exclusive lock on that index page, an exclusive lock here, and an exclusive lock here. Uh, so the, the proposed algorithm was that you acquire a shared lock on the root, you acquire a shared lock on its child, and then once you have the shared lock on the child, you can release the, the shared lock on the parent. Now this is not two-phase locking, strictly speaking, but it's correct. Um, it still provides the same guarantees that you want two-phase locking to, uh, to provide, namely that no other transaction, uh, because all of the transactions are always going to be going down to the root pages, you just need to make sure that you never uh, try and uh, read from a page that is currently being modified. Yeah, so you basically hold on to all of the locks. Um, again, there's... Uh, offhand, I couldn't tell you, but I'm, I'm sure there are variants that, of, of this algorithm that... Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll look into it. I, I will look into it. Um, the other... Th yeah, uh, there might be a, a more subtle definition, uh, a more subtle difference that I'm, I'm glossing over, but I will, I will double check and make sure that. Yes. Once we undo or redo all the transactions of a particular, uh, all the operations of a transaction, uh, do we remove the log entry for the transaction? No, the log. So the log stays. Um, the log essentially can keep growing. Uh, so one thing I haven't uh, I haven't mentioned today it, uh, it's, one of the, it's sort of a one-off slide that I'll throw in at some point but uh, so there's a technique called checkpointing so usually what happens is that the log uh, goes up to a certain point and then uh, every so often you have some process that basically goes through the log uh, finds a particular point and then essentially materializes the entire, uh, everything in the log up to that particular point. Um, one other thing that you can do is keep track of um, everything that has been flushed to disk. So once you are, there, there does come a point where a log entry is no longer necessary. It's usually not immediately after the, the transaction commits. Uh, Basically, what will happen is uh, it'll go through, the, uh, the process will go through the log. It'll basically find uh, the last log record that, um, the last log record such that no log records before it are still relevant to active transactions. And once that, uh, basically up to that point, it'll, it'll sort of append what's known as a, a checkpoint record. Uh, to the end of the log that says, uh, okay, everything up to that particular point in the log can be deleted, and at that point it'll start deleting things up to that point. Okay. And I'll uh, go into a little more detail in uh, either Wednesday or Friday. Oh, sorry, uh, Monday or Wednesday. Any other questions? In forward order, yes. Uh, so you don't necessarily know what the crash point is, and it's entirely possible that you have uh, a multiple uh, a sequence of crashes. So while you're doing the recovery, a crash occurs. And as I said, Aries is the most paranoid algorithm you will ever see. And this is the log record. So this record is a log in the files. Uh, just to start something about these actors. And some kind of process or process, process right? And to recover data at any point, and it doesn't really work. So it'll essentially replay all of the log entries sequentially um, for all transactions. That, so loosely speaking, what happens is that it'll replay all of the log entries for transactions that have successfully committed. 
Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, well, uh, enjoy spring. <laughs>